All right, welcome back to the channel, everyone. If you're new, this channel is called Build It or Buy It. And it revolves around me building various different things. And then when I'm done with the project, evaluating that against whether or not it would have been more economical to buy it versus building it. So if you're interested in the current build, which is this trailer behind me, you can go back and catch some of the past episodes. We're currently on episode nine. For those of men that have been following me, uh, appreciate that. And uh, today we're going to do a little bit more with the hinge. As you know from episode eight, uh, I finished up adding the hinge ears on the back of the trailer. Um, I've got the pin installed now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, come up with a method to retain the pin. Um, there would have been well, probably half a dozen different ways you could have done it. I could have left the pin a little bit long and drilled it with and put a cotter key on each side, a bigger cotter key. Uh, you could do like uh, pins are on heavier construction equipment, which be there, there would be a ear welded on the end and then that ear is bolted to the, to the piece around it. So there's a couple different ways to do it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to have an end cap on each end. And I'll drill and tap the pin for 5 16 national course. And then that cap will have a counter uh, countersunk Allen head cap screw in it to hold those caps on each side. The caps are a bigger diameter than the pin is. So it'll give it a nice finished look and that'll keep the pin from, from coming out either way. But it will allow the pin to fully float. So it'll be, it can turn in the ears on the trailer or on the ears on the ramp so it'll just make overall it won't wear as fast in one area so i'm going to get to, i'm going to get started on that that's one project i'm going to do today and then i'm also going to tack the as i mentioned i'm going to tack the stake pockets in place and I'm, then um, i'll either bring in the expanded metal i've got to bring that in regardless it depends on what the weather does we had um, maybe an inch of snow last night so it's still a little little uh, wet out there and drippy off the roof so um, so anyway, I'll get you moved over to the lathe and show you how I'm going to make those those end caps. So in the lathe, I've got a piece of inch and a quarter diameter round stock that, um, that of course, is bigger than the pin. The pin is one inch, so it just needs to be something larger than the pin that, that can't fit through that one inch hole. And so that's what I'm going to make these... Um, the end pieces out of. I'll give you a quick drawing here of what they're going to look like and then you'll have a better idea what I'm going to do. Right, so there's a side view of the pin and this I guess would be the ear. It goes through. So I'm just going to machine a cap. It'll have a nice chamfer on it. And then there would be the countersunk hole in it. So that'll just go on the end of the pin and cap it off, trim it off nicely. There's, I made the pin a little bit long, so I'll probably put a small count, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> small counter bore in the in the cap, just because. So that's a, just a real quick uh, graphic display of, of what I'm going to do here. Okay. First thing with any, pretty much any turning operation is to face the part off. So I'm going to get that done first and then I will bore the hole. Right here I'm just using a center drill and the drill chuck to get a center hole started and then I'll transition to a drill bit.
is the screw that I'm going to use to um, hold those in. So I'm going to look to see what the total depth of the countersink, or measure that to see what the total depth of the countersink is. So I have a ballpark idea of how thick I'm going to make them. And that's like 198, right at almost 200,000. So um, I'll probably machine these about 300 thousandths or so thick. I'm gonna go over a little over an inch deep and that'll leave enough for both of them. I'm switching to a parting tool here. I'm just going to use it to set the initial length of each one of the end caps. I'll just make a scribe mark on it. What I did here was put a mag backed dial indicator on the way and registered it off the carriage, and that way I can accurately measure how much how much I'm moving the carriage towards the headstock and I decided I'm going to make the parts about 350 thousandths thick so I just zeroed the dial indicator and then moved the carriage uh, to where it read 350 thousandths and made a scribe mark. On there I'll mark out the next one too. Okay, both of those are marked out now for 350 thousandths thick. I'm just setting the compound at about 25 degrees. We'll see what that looks like. There's nothing that has to be exact about this. What I'm doing here is that uh, 25 degrees I mentioned, that's the kind of the tapered angle of that cap. Instead of it just being squared off, it'll have a little bit of an angle to it. And so I use the compound to cut that angle. Um, it was a little flatter than what I liked, so I increased the compound to, I think it was 30 or 35 degrees, and then recut it. What I'm doing here is switching to a small boring bar, and I swung the uh, compound around to about uh, 42 degrees which is the um, the angle for the countersunk cap screw that I'm using and so I'm just cutting that countersink with the lathe versus the countersink bit Okay, right here I put the parting tool back on 
and I'm just using the, the chuck face as a parallel surface and scooting it right up against the chuck and locking the tool post down so that it's perpendicular to the material. So there's one of the finished pieces, and as you can see, when that that Allen screw will just drop down in there, cap screw that will drop in there, that will screw into the end of the shaft and capture the shaft. I think I will try to uh, counterbore these on the back side. It'll be a little tricky to hold them in the lathe because they're not very thick. All right, right here, I'm just using a blank tool bit to a 3 8 inch tool bit to uh, use as a shim against the face of the truck and that way I push the the cap up tight against that that'll hold it pretty square in the chuck and then I'm going to use the same uh, boring bar that I used to cut the counter sinks to reach in and use um, that to cut the counter bore instead of plunging in which would try to shift the part in the chuck and I start at the center hole and draw back towards me that keeps it from wanting to make the part shift so I will take fairly small bites at it. So we're back here at the trailer, as you can see. Give you a little bit of a better side angle. So the way that'll work is this, this little cap will go on, on there with that um, countersunk bolt or countersunk screw. And give a nice finished look to that pin. If you need to take the pin out, you can take just one cap off and remove the pin. Give you an idea, I didn't show you after. I cut the pin the length, but that pin's in there, and with you can tell it's lined up. There's no binding on anything. In fact, when you slide the pin in, they're lined up well enough, you don't even have to flex the pin in it. It just guides itself through all, all five holes. I've got to drill the end of these. Um, that my lathe will only do the through 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 a hole in the headstock is only seven eighths of an inch, so this pin won't go all the way through the headstock. Otherwise, I would drill them in in the lathe. So I think what I'm going to do is take a scrap piece of the one inch. Uh, I'm going to drill the five sixteenths hole, actually smaller than that. This the appropriate size hole for capping. Um, drill that through that slug, and then I'll just extend this out and use a piece of a V block to clamp that on there and use that as a drill guide. That'll help hold that um, directly centered. So I'm going to go machine that part out. You don't really need to see that. You've already seen a little bit of machining. Uh, I'm going to go drill that uh, guide out and then we'll come back and drill and tap these. Okay, so I got that uh, little bushing uh, machined out. Instead of doing the 5 16 hole the way through, which would have been a little bit hard with a hand drill, um, I did it just a pilot size. And so then when I do the, the, the tap size, tap drill for the 5 16 that pilot will guide it straight. So I've got a little, little tiny set of V-blocks here uh, that I inherited from my dad. They're Schultz Level Incorporated. Detroit, USA. So they're kind of a handy little one inch is about the maximum, at least if you're going to use the clamp. 
um, but they're really, really handy for a project like this. Um, Cause I can, like I said, I can put that guide block on there. So I just clamp about half of it, half the hinge pin on the V block and the guide bushing in the other half. Snug them up and that holds that, holds that guide bushing perfectly in line with the the shaft. So anyway, I'll grab a grab a drill and I'll get that um, drilled, and then I'll bring you back here when we're going to do the final hole and the tap. I decided to go ahead and film it. If I break a bit, I break a bit. Might as well let you see that too. And there's a certain individual at work when they see the color of the drill, they're going to give me a bad time. I'm going to have to put a vice grip on the shaft so it doesn't slide. I think I'm probably a good three quarters of an inch into there. So let's take that off. Should be deep enough there by the time you count the cap. Let's get a for five sixteen to eighteen that'll be a letter F. Drill bit. Uh, there's the bottom of the hole. I'm going to turn the air compressor on a little bit so I can get some air to blow that hole out. Alright. Got a 5 sixteenths taper tap and a bottoming tap here, so we'll get to the bottom of the hole with the taper tap first. For those that don't know, the difference between a bottoming tap and a taper tap is, uh, let me pry, I don't know whether you can see this close, but the taper tap is just that, it's ground more into a taper, so it starts easier and cuts easier in the hole, but it doesn't cut a full thread at the very bottom. So if you need a hole where you want the threads to be as full as possible all the way to the bottom, you use a bottom cutting tap, which you can tell doesn't have nearly as much taper to it. So well, there you go, how that comes up and hits the end, keeps that pin from coming out and gives it kind of a nice finished look versus having a cotter key or something like that. All right, well, you don't need to see me do the same process twice, so I'm gonna 
cut it off here and I will go drill and tap the other end. And then we'll come back and probably start laying out the stake pockets. Okay, I'm going to pick back up where I left off. Um, off camera, I did tack the stake pockets into place. I try to have, have content that's not just repetitious. Obviously, you guys have seen me tack enough components into place that you probably didn't need to see that. So I've got those, um, the majority of those tacked in place. I actually lowered the uh, trailer down off or took it off the jack stands. When I was talking to you about the dimensions to the ground, I kind of forgot that it was sitting on jack stands up just a little bit. So it's actually now sitting on the tires and that lowered it down a little bit more. So um, that's, I guess, neither here nor there. So along with the stake pockets, I'm going to attack in place the two pieces of two inch receiver hitch tubing at the front, which is what the um, winch uh, will mount to. That way I can remove the winch if I'm not needing it. So I'm going to, I've got those two pieces of tubing right over there, um, cut to length and I'm going to center punch and drill for a five, regular 5 8 hitch pin. So I'm going to show you one thing, I mean, not, not that drilling holes is anything new to you, but I'm going to show you a tool that I use sometimes um, if I need a hole to be fairly precise. If I uh, had a milling machine, of course I could put it in the milling machine and just find it and, and have it exactly perfect. But what I do in the case of this is use a little bit of layout dye uh, to blacken the area where I'm going to have the mark. And then I just use a pair of dial calipers to, to uh, from the edge to make a slight mark in that layout die. And then I'll use an optical center punch. So I'll scoot you over here so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So you can see on this one, the little bit of layout die there. Now there's the light you can catch it. So that, that there's that X on there with the dial indicator. So that's actually fairly, fairly, maybe not as accurate as having in a milling machine, but it is very, very close. So um, if you've never seen an optical center punch before, don't know what it is. Um, it's a machine piece of aluminum, a little piece of cork on it. So it doesn't slide around with two holes in it. And then it comes with two lenses that, that fit down in that hole tightly. One lens has a crosshair, as you can see. The other lens has a bullseye. I prefer the crosshair. So you, you put that down in that hole. And then it's, all, it's machined. I've got fingerprints all over it, probably. The top of the lens is machine concaved, so you get magnification by looking down through it. So you can line that up very accurately over the crosshair marks you made with, and in my case, the calipers. And then without moving the base, you take that um, lens out and you put, replace it with a hardened steel pin. Comes with the kits come with two pins, one with like a 30 degree angle and the other with a 60 drag, and then you, that pin goes in that exact same hole, and you just hit it with a hammer, and that gives you a center punch directly, as close as you're gonna get to the, um, to the center point. So I'll get it lined up here, and I'll, I think I should be able to hold the camera right over the lens, and that way you can see what I'm seeing, but let me get, let me get it lined up first, and then I'll see what I can, Oh, yeah. Out there we go. That's zoomed out. That's much better. So you can see that's and it's not even magnified as much um, with the camera as it is with the naked eye. So um, that you can see how it lets you really line those crosshairs up on that point, and then you just very carefully you hold it down with one hand to make sure it doesn't move. So anyway, that's a, anytime I can show you a new tool or a technique, I know I, 
I like cool new tools. Not that these are any new. They've been around for a long time. But anyway, I thought I'd show that to you. And then I'll uh, bring you back here in a few minutes when I've got some more things to talk about. Alrighty, everyone. I hope you found that um, content on the hinge pin interesting. That's one goal I have is to try to, as I create new content, I try to have it either be new content or if it's, let's say, a technique, it's applied in a different manner. Um, I know there's some YouTube channels that, that I subscribe to and follow. Sometimes it's the, the a lot of repetitious, you know, whether it be in a drill in a hole or whatever it is. Um, so I try not to do that. So, uh, which is a good segue into kind of what you can probably see in the background, which there's quite a bit more here than there was uh, just a minute ago when I was doing the hinge. So I'm ready at this point to figure out what my final ride height is going to be as well as to determine whether or not my axle placement um, was correct based on the math. If you recall back to that first episode, I know the math is, is sound as far as how to calculate uh, the balance point. The one thing I was unsure is if you recall when I wanted to have that 200 pound tongue weight, 150 to 200 pound tongue weight, I put in a negative value for that and I think that was the correct way. So um, here in just a few minutes, we're gonna figure out um, how close that is. One thing that will affect it slightly is there are some things that um, trying to determine the weights exactly are difficult. The steel is really easy. I mean, there's um, literally the pound per weight for every piece of steel used is easily, easily available. The tricky part is the lumber. Anybody that's bought lumber, especially from one of the big box stores, knows that it could be anywhere from you practically could wring water out of it to being nice and dry and checked, so that varies greatly. I did pick up um, some used lumber that I found on Marketplace. The guy had some two by six by 20 foot long um, that were in good shape. They were painted white. He had them underneath the carport. Um, so I didn't like that. So you'll see, I'll, I'll pick you up here. You can kind of see that some of them still have some white paint on them. There's a good example here. Um, what I did is I just ran them through my planer. I set their planer. It only took off like a 64th of an inch. Um, so I didn't, overall, I didn't reduce the thickness by any significant amount. But it, it did a nice job of taking the paint off versus trying to sand it all off. Because those were who knows how many years old and really, really nice and seasoned, they weighed probably half of what uh, bottom lumber had. I didn't have quite enough to do the whole trailer. I had to, I just got back from the lumber supplier and picked up uh, three more there. So that was one weight when I did the calculations that I just kind of made a ballpark based on what fur should weigh per square foot. So that, because I have all of that used lumber that's a lot lighter, that will affect that overall weight some, but not too much. Um, the rest of the situation, as you can see here, I, I don't have the ramps made, but basically all the material that it's going to take to make the ramps is laying there, and it's um, laying in the in the spot that basically where the center of gravity would be with the ramp when the ramps are built. Um, I tacked all of the stake pockets in place. I'll do a quick walk around here. I tacked all the stake pockets in place, and I put the rub rail on. So. That weight is accounted for the fenders and the fender trim sheet. That's there, but that doesn't affect, because that's exactly on the center line of the axle or the, the trunnion, that has no effect on the balance point, but it did affect on how much the spring um, compressed, which that was the two things I'm trying to accomplish. One, to figure out my tongue weight, and then secondly, to figure out where the finished height is so I know how much to drop the beaver tail down. Uh, I've also got the toolboxes in there. The only thing I have left to add, basically, there's a couple random scraps of steel on the deck. Those aren't just random. Those are, I'm going to have some um, angle iron to hold the fenders. And so those are, are within a few ounces of what that angle would weigh. I didn't have that angle on hand. So that's why those pieces are there. So all I have left to do is I figured out the jacks. I did decide I'm going to use jacks on the back. If you recall back to the first episode, I talked about a couple different ways you can keep the 
trailer from tipping up when you put weight on it. I decided to use jacks. So I'm going to pause it here for a second. I've got to, I haven't ordered those yet, but I know which ones I'm going to buy. So I'm going to look up what their weight is and then I'll grab some stacks of steel or some chunks of steel or some bricks or something that weighs the same amount and set them where those jacks will be. And that will, that will um, reflect what the jack, added weight of the jacks is, though it's not. Yeah, I don't actually expect it to change the trailer any at all. So anyway, um, I'm going to grab that and then I will bring you back and we will actually put the tongue on the scale and see what it says. Okay, so we're ready for the moment of truth. Let me get you set in here where you can see the scale. Hopefully you can read that. If not, I'll zoom in when I edit. Oh, that'll probably be in the way of the piece that I'm going to use. You'll have to read the number sideways. Okay, so what I got going on is the trailer is sitting on the axles and it's sitting on the tongue jack. And um, I just cut a board that's this height between the coupler and the scale. Um, so I'll slip that board in there and then lower the tongue jack down until the full weight is supported by this board pushing on the scale that'll tell us what the uh, tongue weight is. Um, coincidentally, I did measure the ball height. If you recall, 19 inches is what I was shooting for, and it's like 18 and 3 quarters, so the ball height worked out well. So let's get going here. I'm going to raise it up some so the scale comes on just when it sees weight on it. So I'll try to do it fairly quickly here. So if you can see that, it's 227 pounds tongue weight. So if you recall, I was shooting for 10 to 15 percent um, of the trailer weight on the tongue. That's kind of a general rule of thumb in the trailer. Based on knowing what all the materials weigh, it's going to be right in that 2300 pound range. So we're pretty much right dead, dead nuts on 10 percent. So that uh, pretty much confirms that the Putting that negative value in for the tongue weight was the correct thing, or the correct way to do it. It's always good when a plan comes together. Okay, so what I'm going to do... Um, Next, as I indicated, those stake pockets and those things, those are just tacked into place. So now that I know that the axle spacing is just about right, um, I wanted the axles back as far as I could get them, but uh, I could cheat it a little bit more, but I don't want to add that much more weight to the tongue because I do have to put a battery in that tongue box. So that'll add probably another 25, 30 pounds to the tongue weight empty. So that's good. The axles are in the right place. So. I can now weld those in and I'm just going to start um, welding on the stake pockets, uh, the rub rail. Um, you've seen me weld that stuff on plenty before so I'm not going to bore you with that. So I think we're pretty close to a half an hour after I get done editing this. So I suspect this probably will be the last portion of this episode which is nine. Um, and then I will bring you back uh, the next really about all that's left other than painting it is to build the ramp so I'll bring you back in episode 10 I'll focus on uh, building the ramps and getting those set up um, just uh, let me grab a tape measure and I'll show you where we ended up height wise I know I measured that back on I think it was episode 8 and it was a, if I remember right it was like 18 or something I didn't even think about it my bad it was still sitting on those RV style jack stands and I had unloaded the suspension quite a bit to make it plenty stable so obviously that measurement was completely bogus so now that it's not on those anymore and the all the weight is sitting on the axles and the springs are compressed as much as they're going to on an empty load we ended up with about 13 about 13 and 3 eighths of an inch the camera angle probably makes it look more like 13 but uh, 13 and 3 eighths is where we ended up to the bottom of the trailer. 
So in theory, you would split that in directly in half, and then that will create that wedge. And then the, the ramps would make up the equivalent of that wedge. So when they're down, they would touch. I might, um, I might tweak it a little bit since I am going to use jacks to help support it from tipping. I really don't need the ramps to come down and touch the ground, not that it would hurt, but if you have a really heavy load on there, um, trying to get the wrap, ramps deployed can be a little tricky. It's not too hard. Even if they touch, you just back the trailer up and that causes them to fold down underneath and same thing. If you can't fold them up by hand, you can just pull ahead and that will cause them to, to kind of cam out from underneath the trailer. So it can still be done, but I might make it to where they're just about touching the ground based on this load right now. So that 13 and 3 eighths, it won't be probably quite half that. But anyway, I'll go over all that when I come back in episode 10. Oh, and I guess that's the other thing I'll do in episode 10. It'll be interesting to see how well it works out is now that I know this finished pipe, I'll be able to cut the beaver tail. I'll be able to cut that pipe piece out here. And I'm hoping that I'll probably put a lot bigger tip in the torch. I don't have a rosebud. Uh, I need to get one, I guess. But I'll just put a bigger cutting tip in the torch. And I think... I'm hoping that I can heat both flanges, just go back and forth on both flanges fast enough to get that um, red hot. And then with what the tail weighs, I'm hoping it'll just drift down by itself. If not, it's not the big deal to push on. So anyway, I'll see you back at uh, most likely at episode 10.